Hello, welcome to Online Worship with Community United Methodist Church, Quincy, California. I'm Pastor Andrew Davis, pastor of this wonderful congregation, and I want to welcome all of you wherever you're worshiping with us, whenever you're worshiping with us. We're glad that you're here today. So just a few words on today's service is we're going to be celebrating a celebration of Holy Communion, and we do have permission to do communion online, and so that'll come later in the service and it'll be on your online order of worship. And so if you need to pause the video to get your elements, we're asking that you have a piece of bread, a cracker, or a cup of grape juice or beverage of your choice as we take part in Holy Communion. And so as we worship, I invite you to take it all in. I invite you to participate as fully as you wish. And so let us open with a word of prayer. Loving and holy God, we thank you for today and thank you for this time to worship and thank you that we can worship wherever we're at, whenever we're worshiping. And so Lord, may your Holy Spirit be with us as we come together today and as we worship you and praise you and energize us to go out and be your hands and feet and the hands and feet of Jesus in this world. In Christ's name we pray, amen. And so I invite you to Join us in the opening hymn, 2126 in the Black Hymnal, Faith We Sing, where the words are printed in your online bulletin, as we sing together, All Who Hunger. If you have any kids or if you're young at heart, I invite you to gather around the screen as we hear a special message from Grandma Susie. Good morning, boys and girls. I'm Grandma Susie, and I'm going to tell you a story today about sharing. And the story is about Jesus feeding 5,000 people. I brought a picture today to kind of show you. The story starts out where Jesus and his disciples crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee and thousands of people were following Jesus. He had been preaching and teaching 
and working miracles for a couple of years. And all these people wanted to see him because he was making sick people well, he was making blind people see, and he was just telling them stories and everyone loved to hear him. Well, they had been following him for days and days and sleeping outside. And since they didn't plan on going on such a long trip, they didn't pack enough food. So here it was late in the day and Jesus was tired. So he climbed up this hill and sat down with his disciples around him. But pretty soon Jesus saw this large crowd of people climbing up the hill. And the disciples said, Jesus, why don't you send these people home so that they can go to the nearby villages and get food? It's really late. And Jesus said, you know, we don't need to send them away. Why can't we feed them? And turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? Well, Jesus already knew what he was going to do, so he was just testing Philip. Well, Philip replied, even if we work for months, we would never have enough food to feed all these people. Then Andrew said, there's a young boy here with five small loaves of bread and two fish. But what good is Adam with this huge crowd? Now, if you were that boy and you had gone fishing that morning, and you caught a couple of fish and cooked them for your dinner that night, and that was all the food you had, would you be willing to share everything you had with that huge crowd of people? Something to think about. Jesus said, tell everyone to sit down. So they all sat down on these grassy slopes. Now there were 5,000 men, not counting the women and children. Let's see. 5,000. That's as many people that live in Quincy. That's like all the people at the county fair on the busiest night. And they all sat down. Well, Jesus took the loaves and the two fish and he thanked God. And then he passed them out to his disciples and he said, here, pass these out to all the people. And the amazing thing was when an apostle took the fish and gave it to somebody, another fish appeared. And when another disciple took a bread and gave it to somebody, another loaf appeared. So all the 5,000 people, plus the women and children, all got fed. And then when they, they didn't want to waste anything, so Jesus said, okay, all you disciples, go and gather up everything that's left so we won't be wasteful. And there were 12 disciples, and each disciple had a big basket of food that was left over. So there were 12 baskets of leftover food. And everybody ate as much as they wanted. So it's very interesting that everybody was totally amazed after seeing this miracle, and many people believed in Jesus when they doubted before, after seeing this. So there's several things that this lesson teaches us. Sometimes when we're asked for help, it may not be a convenient time or a good time. I mean, Jesus was really tired, but still, they asked for help. And the needy always seem to, be, to need more than what we have when they ask us for something. Jesus asks only that I use what I have and he'll take care of the rest. We don't need to worry about that. Jesus never sends people away when they ask for his help. Sharing Jesus' love with other people can mean more than giving food. It can mean a kind word or a smile or a shoulder to cry on or someone to talk to. Jesus uses other people to help other people so that they're all blessed. Jesus always gave thanks before a meal, and we should remember to do that too and thank God for the food that we have. When I have only a little bit to give, 
it multiplies and comes back with leftovers. Anything is possible with Jesus, even today. You know, the stories about this little boy and all you boys and girls out there, you think that you don't have very much to give. And if this story was told today, there would be this millionaire who bought food for all these people or a big helicopter that flew over and dropped food down to the people. But this story is about a little boy who had a couple of fish and some loaves of bread. The story was about this little boy who ended up being the hero of the story because he was willing to share the little that he had. And that's the lesson that Jesus is trying to teach us, that we need to share whatever we have with everybody. And that's how we show Jesus' love and share Jesus' love with everyone. Think we can do that? Well, let's say a little prayer, and then I've got something to share with you. Dear Father in heaven, help us to realize that even though we may not have very much, we can still share what we have with others. We can show others that you love us and that you love them by sharing a kind word, help somebody with something that they need, sharing our food, whatever. Please help us each day to share your love with all that we meet. In Jesus' name, amen. Now something that's always fun to share is laughter. Jesus was really, he loved laughter. He loved kids and he loved laughter. So I'm going to share a little laughter with you with my little friend here. His name is Mickey. Mickey the monkey. And he's going to make you laugh. Oh, come on, Mickey. As we hear the word of God this morning, our first lesson comes to us from the epistle of Romans 9, 1 through 5. So let us hear the words of the Apostle Paul in his letters to the Romans, and I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it by the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and an unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my own people, my kindred, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from them, according to the flesh, comes the Messiah who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Our gospel lesson comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, verses through 21. Let us listen to this story of the feeding of the 5,000. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour has come. And the hour is now late. Send the crowds away, so that they may go into the villages and buy food. 
Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men besides women and children. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, Holy Spirit, may you work through me as we hear this message today and May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. Well, one of the things that I found in my four and a half, almost five years of ministry now is that things can change very, very quickly. Wednesday was one of those days. And that morning we had a very small, intimate wedding on the front steps of our porch. And it was such a joyous time, filled with love and filled with the uniting of two families and just a wonderful morning. But then around one o'clock, I started seeing stories and pictures on my Facebook feed of a fire downtown, a plume of smoke rising from the air. Well, when I tried to drive home around 2 o'clock, the smoke was getting pretty thick. And Jackson Street was a mess and actually couldn't even get down the side streets as they had blocked them all off. And so I ended up having to turn around and, walking, and walk home, even through the smoke, which is also why I'm thankful to have a mask, although it still smelled. Well, sadly, by then the Crisis Center, which has been an important lifeline to our community, was engulfed in flames, along with Quintopia Brewing Company and the costume shop for Drama Works and West End Theater. Well, even though the Crisis Center is building as a total loss, the work is not stopping with them. On the other hand, Quintopia's brewing area, several homes, and the theater's costume storage are total losses. When I was looking through this month's series, little did I know how much our gospel lesson would be relevant to what was happening this week. See, this is where we're called to be the church. This is where we're called to give them something and to share our love with our greater community. So as we begin this new series, Because God, or also known as God's How is Our Why, we're going to be thinking about how we can go deeper in living our faith, whether you're new to the Christian faith or a seasoned veteran. We can always receive new insights, even as we adapt to how we do church today. And especially when we look at what is possible, as opposed to what's impossible. Well, as we explore Jesus' miracles and Paul's understanding of Jesus' ministry this next month, let's consider some questions here to begin with. And I invite you to write these down and reflect on these questions, too, throughout this whole entire month, not just today. How do you live into these miraculous moments in Jesus' life in our world today? Are we called to be miracle workers too? What if we are asking the wrong question about statements and actions of Jesus? Such as, what if it isn't supposed to be a how, but a why? What if it's not a behavior to emulate, but a motivation to live as followers of Jesus Christ? Well, in some ways, we're changing this up by starting with questions instead of concluding with questions in today's message. And so, as you reflect on these questions, I invite you to, you know, respond in the comments of the video or send me an email. Or when I bring back the Zoom coffee hours again, hopefully this coming week. We can engage that way. Let's use this time to grow in faith together and to see where we see ourselves in these stories. Well, today's texts are both a bit of a contrast, and it's not easy to try and connect both the epistle and the gospel lessons together, but we're going to do our best to do. Well, the feeding of the 5,000 
is one of the most powerful stories in our gospel that we just read in Matthew, in the book of Matthew. The fact is that this story, the miracle of feeding 5,000 or 4,000 people, appears in all four of the gospels because it shows the importance of our calling to give something people to eat, to provide aid where we can and when we're best equipped. Well, as we engage with the text a little bit, Jesus is trying to retreat from the crowds after learning about the beheading of his cousin, John the Baptist, in verses 1 through 12 of this same chapter. He wants to spend some time alone with God in order to process his own grief. And so, in his attempt to get away from the crowds, well, the crowds get wind of it, and like on our social media feeds, it's gone viral, and so people find out, and well, they go and follow Jesus wherever he goes. And they're all rushing to his, where his boat would land because they need him. Now, honestly, if I'm in that position, I'll admit that I, having learned the death of, of a loved one, I'm not going to be in the mood to deal with people very much, just like the disciples in verse 15. Instead, I'd want to send the crowd away. Well, Jesus didn't do that. Instead, he showed compassion for the crowd and told the disciples in verse 16, you give them something to eat. Don't send them away. It's a big part of how Jesus gave of himself. And that's a big part of how ministry is very sacrificial too. And even following Christ can be very sacrificial because we're giving of our time. We're giving of ourselves. See, Jesus recognizes the need of those around him. And he wants to meet those needs. And as we will see when he feeds those 5,000 with just five loaves of bread and two fish. See, it shows how God can take a little bit and make a huge difference in the lives of those around us. It's just like little things we can do here in the church, especially when we're going to need to be stepping up now and providing assistance to our community. Even though the crisis center is continuing their work, yet we still can Build that partnership that we have. Because our calling is to help everybody that's been affected by Wednesday's fires in one way or another, either through donations, through providing food. And we're in the process of working with our faith community. And we'll be in the process of being in communication with the leadership to see what needs there are. See how we as the church can give them something. See, in our scripture lesson, in our gospel lesson, Jesus took just a little bit and turned it into enough, which is how our gifts here in the church, no matter how little, can be turned into enough. And we've seen this in the Hebrew Bible, too, of how God provides, takes a little bit and provides just enough, such as in the book of Exodus, when Israel was in the desert for 40 years and were provided manna and quail, satisfying their hunger. Well, more often than not in today's world, we have the tendency to operate from an attitude and a position of scarcity instead of abundance. Well, as one of our former district superintendents would say, it's time to lose our butts. But we don't have enough money. But we don't have enough of resources. We don't have enough food. And it happens in the church too. Oftentimes to say, well, but we just don't have enough to do this. Although we still manage to make ends meet and to give something. An example of how God can take just a little and use it to make just enough. Like the disciples did in today's gospel reading, we tend to look at what we don't have rather than what we do. We tend to feel overwhelmed by the problems we face rather than being willing to start with what we might with what might seem like inadequate resources and see what God can can and do with what we bring. Well, early on in this pandemic, if which seems quite a while ago, and back in March when it all began, yet it was hard to find things in the grocery store because people were panic buying operating out of a fear of scarcity, except leaving very little for others who might have needed certain things, like toilet paper or healthy food. And see, we still see some of the effects right now 
when we go to the store, whether to save more grocery outlet or Safeway, is there's still some gaps in the shelves. Well, during that time, I often had to get very creative in the kitchen as I was trying some new recipes and, well, sometimes didn't have what I needed, so had to improvise a little bit and adapt a little bit. Kind of being like on the Food Network shows Chopped or Guy's Grocery Games because things were quite limited for time. And actually it ended up working out because it ended up showing what's possible and that something can still taste really good even though I didn't have the called for ingredients. And I hope that that was an eye-opening time for all of us because there are so many things that we tend to take for granted today. And too often when we think of scarcity, when in fact, we can still live in abundance, especially when it comes to life. And see, this pandemic has also impacted how we in the church have been able to give the people something to eat because we had to suspend our hot pot lunch that was happening on Mondays. We had to suspend community supper on Wednesdays. Yet it's my hope that we can still find some creative ways to keep people safe, yet give them something to eat and give them something in general. And now with the crisis center building gone and offering some food items in a small pantry outside, maybe this is where we in the church can step up, maybe even look into seeing how we can provide and fill that gap. Because hunger is a real thing, and one of our core callings in the church is to feed the hungry, just like Jesus did the 5,000. Professor Jennifer Kaland at Iona College writes that there is a need to feed the hungry in our world today. According to the World Food Program, approximately 795 million people in the world do not have enough food to lead a healthy, active life. That is about one in nine people on Earth. Hunger is related to illnesses and developmental disabilities. It is difficult, if not impossible, for a hungry child to focus in school. What are we as Christians doing to feed the hungry? Many churches have kitchens that supply food and provide meals to those in need. How can we and do we contribute to those efforts? Your offering can be the little resources like that of the disciples that when blessed and added with others can bring forth an increase. Planting gardens, giving of our excesses, and advocating for and supporting programs that feed the hungry are all ways that we too can bring forth God's kingdom here on earth. Well, even though we didn't read it last week, the parable of the mustard seed is one of, in Matthew 13, is one of the most powerful analogies because it's the size of a mustard seed that becomes something big. And that's about how God uses little things to create bigger things. And that's perhaps where we, as God's people, and how we can fill those needs of the hungry around us. You know, it's basically how, where God's how becomes our why. As we've, over the years, we've supported the work of the Crisis Center. We've also supported the work of our food bank, Community Assistance Network. And we have a number of people in our church, including one of our members of the church who coordinates it. And likewise, if you have excess in your garden, feel free to share with others around you. Or if you have extra canned food that you're not eating right away, maybe donate it to can. And likewise with my garden, if, hopefully if I'm able to produce enough, I enjoy, I enjoy, I know I enjoy sharing excess with my neighbors and bartering a little bit. Sometimes we exchange things, like one has corn, I might have beans or tomatoes or peppers. See, we need to ask ourselves why it is hard to look at abundance, yet easier to look at scarcity. Well, unlike the disciples who have an attitude of scarcity, Paul is coming from an abundance of resources in our epistle lesson. In verse 4 from the Message Translation, Paul names family, glory, covenants, relationship, worship, and promises as an important resource of our faith. And the resources that Paul lists can even apply to us today. Paul really wants to see his family embrace Jesus as the fulfillment of all they had worked and longed for throughout their long journey of wrestling with God. See, Paul wants his people to see the amazing abundance of resources of their faith 
that is before them in God's abundance grace that's available to everyone. Well, when we look at both of these readings, they both speak of how hunger is both spiritual and physical. And as you saw how physical hunger impacts everyone and how we can help to feed people, how can we give those who are spiritually hungry something to eat? How do we embrace everyone who enters our doors or comes to us for help? Especially those who have been pushed to the margins or have been neglected or passed over or rejected. See, the spiritual resources that Paul talks about are a lot like the five loaves and the two fish that Jesus multiplied because we can share words of hope, words of faith, comfort, and love to a hurting and hungry world, and especially for those who are spiritually hungry. See, I believe there's still a hunger for God's word out there, which is up to us in the church to give them something. As we joyfully live our, out our faith and operate as Christ's ambassadors in the here and now, and despite this pandemic, we can still share what we have. Even if we aren't able to give everyone something to eat at coffee hour, potlucks, the hot pot lunch, or community supper right now, we still have something to offer. And we can also continue to find ways to help the crisis center and surrounding businesses recover that were destroyed in Wednesday's fire. Which leads me to ask, how are you going to give them something? How are you going to give the people around you something to eat, whether it's spiritually or physically. And as we've been hungering for Holy Communion, we're going to be coming to the table of the Lord today for the first time since March. As we receive this spiritual nourishment through the bread and fruit of the vine. And through this table, we can receive God's grace and abundant life through this table. The table where everybody is welcome because this is the table that Christ invites us to, to give us something to eat, so that we in turn can give someone else something to eat. Offered to you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let the church say, Amen. And so let us join in singing in the United Methodist Hymnal, page 141, or printed in your online bulletin, Children of the Heavenly Father. this time of Holy Communion and if you wish to participate I invite you to pull up your online bulletin and follow along in the liturgy and responding in the bold print although if you're not comfortable taking part in this you are welcome to fast forward to the closing hymn if you wish but I want to emphasize that everybody is welcome 
You don't need to be a member of our church or any church in order to participate in Holy Communion in the United Methodist Church because we have an open table, an open table that Christ invites all of us to. Although, as we do come to the table, we do ask that you come with an open heart. You come with a desire to live in peace with each other. You come with a desire to repent of your sins and the ways you fall short and to love God and to love your neighbor. And so as we prepare our hearts to take this holy meal, let us confess our sins as one body before God. As we say together, God Almighty, we confess that we have not always lived up to you what you have wanted us to do. We have been quick to judge, quick to speak badly of others, and quick to anger. We have sometimes failed in letting your Holy Spirit guide our way instead of dousing the, instead dousing the flames with your Spirit with cold water and our personal preferences. Forgive us, O Lord, for these times where we do not do what you want us to do. Forgive us, Lord, for these times where we do for our shortcomings. Renew us, Lord, in our relationship with you and with each other, so that the fire of your Holy Spirit will be burned brightly within each of us. And so let us take some time in silent prayer to con confess individually the ways that we fall short. Good news. Good news, good news. Christ died for us while we still sinned and while we still fell short. That is proof of God's infinite love and grace for each of us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven. Alleluia, amen. God's Holy Spirit is present with us in this very time and place. We know and sense our Creator is in our midst. Let us give everything we bring, our hearts, intentions, and thoughts over to God. We give them all joyfully. Let us also give thanks to God who gets everything. Of course God gets everything. God made everything. Let us show our thanks and honor to God. You're so right. Giving God our thanks and honor is the best thing we can ever do. So let's do it. God, you created everything. Every living thing was put on earth by you. All people of every nation belong to you. So together with all creation, everything on earth and in heaven, we add our voices and join in with the world's eternal song of praise. Holy, incredible, and unimaginable God, full of power and strength. All of heaven and earth are full of the signs of your glory. You amaze us. And your son, Jesus Christ, who sent us, is equally amazing. We never cease to be amazed by you. God, you are amazing, and so is your son, Jesus Christ. At just the right time, you sent Jesus to fill us, to, to us, and filled him with your Holy Spirit so he could show us the way you intended us to live. Filled with your wisdom, he came to show us the truth about the universe. We remember how nearly 2,000 years ago, Jesus ate the Passover meal with his disciples in an upper room in Jerusalem, Israel. During that ceremonial meal, Jesus took the bread, thanked God for it, broke it, and told the friends he knew would betray him, this is my body, which I give to you. Take it and eat it and remember me. When the feast was over, he took the cup of wine, thanked God for it, and said to the friends he knew would desert him, this is my blood given to you as a new agreement before humans and God. Drink it and remember me. According to your holy plan, Jesus was arrested and executed as a terrorist threatening Rome's national security with a radical message of how your great love turns the world upside down, throws the head honchos from their thrones, and lifts up the poor. Nobody's to first place. 
Three days after his execution by crucifixion on a cross, the women of his group discovered his tomb was empty and Mary Magdalene was the first to encounter the risen Christ. Resurrected to show us how great and powerful your love is for us. Fifty days after Christ's resurrection, people gathered in Jerusalem again, this time to celebrate the festival of the harvest called Pentecost. Among the followers of Jesus, your wild and holy spirit broke loose. Everyone there was drawn to witness the birth of Christ's church and the gift of your never-failing presence remains with us in this world today. Your spirit continues to speak to us in our own language and leads us in the way of Christ as we follow Jesus' final instructions to tell the whole world about your love. We remember Christ's perfect love and life by happily and thankfully giving our lives back to you as holy living sacrifices. Receive this gift of our lives together with Christ's gifts for us as we speak the truth about our faith. Christ dies. Christ lives. Christ is coming again. Join me in praying as we bless over these symbols. God, we ask you to once again pour your Holy Spirit on each person in this room and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them the body and blood of Christ so that by taking them into our bodies, you will make us the body of Christ for the rest of the world and everyone will know that you can make all wrongs right. Renew us in this holy meal and help us to remember that we are Christ's church. Strengthen our faith and service in every nation and with all people so we can faithfully show and tell the world how much your love can do. Use your Holy Spirit to unite us with Christ and with each other so that we can care for the world until Christ comes again and we join around his table as a family in perfect love. We proclaim to the world that you possess every good quality and you deserve all of our honor and obedience now and forever. And so as we continue to pray, we lift up those who are facing surgery, those who are facing illness, especially those who are affected by COVID-19, the firefighters injured in Wednesday's fire and those who are in need of your healing presence, Lord, we lift each of them to you by name. We lift them up to you, O Lord. We pray, O Lord, for those who are grieving today, those who have lost loved ones, those who have lost pets, those who have lost jobs, lost property, lost homes, those who are feeling hopeless, those who are feeling discouraged. Give them your words of comfort, O Lord, and may your comforting grace surround each one. And may you remind us that nothing can separate us from your love. And so let us name each one, Lord. We lift them up to you, O oh Lord. We pray, Lord, for our world, our nation, our state, our community. Pray for the leaders of each, especially during these troubling times. And we pray, Lord, for wisdom and guidance in everything that our leaders do. We pray for wisdom. We pray for integrity. We pray, Lord, for your will to be done here on earth. And so let us name each one, O oh Lord. We lift them up to you, O oh Lord. We pray, Lord, for our church. We pray, Lord, for the churches in our California Nevada Conference and for Bishop Cacano and for Blake, our superintendent. We pray for all of our clergy. We pray for our, our churches here in Quincy and Plumas County and beyond and pray for the church universal that your Holy Spirit may break in and lead to revival and that your Holy Spirit may work through all of us to energize us to go out and serve and to be the church in this world. And so, Lord, we name all of them in this moment.
We lift them to you, O oh Lord. And Lord, we pray for all of our essential workers, those who are traveling on business. We pray for those who are in, in, right in the path of this virus and praying, Lord, for all of the unspoken requests as you know what's on our hearts. And so, Lord, we name each of those before you right now. We lift them to you, O Lord. So, Lord, receive our prayers today as we lift all of their, our prayers, our praises, as we join in celebrating the joys, and as we continue to bring the concerns, and we give you thanks for the joys that are in life. And we leave all of these in your throne of grace, and we place these all in your hands. And so with the disciples from generation to generation and with the confidence of children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so the many grains of wheat that have come to form this one loaf create in us one body just as each of us come together to form the body of Christ. And all of the grapes that have come together for this fruit of the vine are like the way that we come together to form the one body of Christ. And so I invite you to take your cracker or your piece of bread. And so my sisters and brothers, the body of Christ that is broken for you and if you wish to dip it into the cup, or if you just wish to sip from the cup, you're welcome to do so. And so the blood of Christ and the cup of salvation that is poured out for you. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for feeding us, for giving us something to eat. And we thank you, Lord, for this holy mystery. As we receive this nourishment through these elements of bread and fruit of the vine, may it empower us and fill us with your Holy Spirit to go out and to be the church of God here in this world, to be the body of Christ in everything that we do. And so, Lord, we give this all to you in the name of the Holy Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And so as we prepare to go forth from here, I invite you to turn to page 593 in the United Methodist Hymnal or the words in your online order of worship service as we say together, Here I am, Lord.
Give them something to eat. Give them a word of hope. Share a piece of your heart. Share your faith. Whatever you do, do it with joy. Do it with love. Invite people into a sense of belonging. And so as we go forth, may God bless each of us. May God be with us as we go and joyfully live our faith throughout the world and as we be in this ambassadors here on earth. And so in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let the church say, Amen. And as always, don't forget to wear your masks. <laughs>